Hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I'd like to present part seven of my series on the gross pathology of cattle, and we're going to talk about the liver. <clears throat> As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank my colleagues and friends who have provided me images over the years, which have allowed me to put these lectures together. Let's start with the babies. And this is a case of fibrinopurulent omphalophlebitis with extension into the liver. The umbilicus is over here on the left. This animal probably had some problem with passive transfer. This is usually involved in cases of navel ill or joint ill. If the navel is hot and swollen and when touched ruptures and pours out purulent, uh, exudate, and that's all there is. That's called navel ill. These animals generally run a fever, have a reduced appetite. The problem is when the infective material extends up the remnant of the umbilical vein. There is no blood flow after birth in this vein, so it's a extension. It's this much slower process, but it will extend up and it will go into the liver because this is where oxygenated blood comes into the, fe uh, the fetus and it, it dumps into the portal system. And from there, the bacteria can get into the systemic circulation. Here we have abscesses in the liver. One of the first organs in these cases to be affected are the joints. They become hot and stiff and painful and the animals don't want to move. And at that point, this is called joint ill. But you can see bacteria in any organ of the body at this point. The ones that we usually see are the ones that are in the environment. So staph and strep are big ones. Of course, the coliforms. And then you occasionally be able to culture a fusobacterium necrophorum, which is a common commensal in the GI tract and is present in, in every deposit of feces in the animal's environment. And if the animal survives long enough, Tuparella pyogenes can be cultured, not because it's probably the original contaminant, but because it's gone into these abscesses and sort of taken over and kicked out uh, the agent that started the process. So this is navel ill or joint ill. Just another case uh, here of, of an infected umbilical vein extending up into the liver. And you can easily see how the infection spreads to the rest of the body. Here's an old but a great picture of a liver from an aborted fetus. When you see this cobblestone pattern in the liver, you want to think about granulomatous inflammation. And that should tell you that this is a long-standing bacteria, not a sudden abortion, but something that the animal, the mother has had, and the fetus has been exposed to for quite a while during development. Eventually, it'll get to the point where the animal will be expelled. And a couple of things will cause this. Uh, Brucella abortus, will cause this in addition to a, a fibrino-suppurative uh, uh, pleuritis and pleuronemonia. But this particular picture is from a very interesting disease, which is only seen in one region of the world. Uh, in California, Oregon, and Nevada, um, in the Sierra Nevada mountain ranges, and it's known as either epizootic bovine abortion or uh, foothill abortion. The cause of agent has gone through quite a number of names and is now referred to as Pahawayobacter abortibovis. And the vector of this is an orgasic tick, the Pahawayo tick, which lives in decomposing, decomposing plant litter at the base of trees in this area of the country. And it's attracted to cows by the carbon dioxide that the cows give off. Once every few months, the, the tick pierces the uh, cow skin and feeds on the blood and transmits this spirochete. It's an interesting disease because only naive cows who've never been infected before will be infected. The animals are usually infected during the second trimester and abortion occurs during the third trimester. After the abortion, the animal will never abort again. 
The lesions that are seen in the abortive fetuses are fairly characteristic. You have granulomatous hepatitis, splenitis, thymitis with marked thymic atrophy, and lymphoid hyperplasia. The mothers abort without any premonitory signs, and the fetus is seldom autolyzed. It is common practice in the area to try to expose heifers before they become pregnant within the area to lessen the chances of them becoming infected with pa I never can get it right. It's a tough one to pronounce. Paharoweobacter abortibovis. Somebody needs to come up with a new name. Here is a devastating disease that is seen in parts of southern Africa, usually affecting young animals, but occasionally can result in severe hepatic necrosis and death in adults. This is Rift Valley Fever. It's caused by a mosquito-transmitted bunya virus, much like a related disease, Wesselbron disease. In addition, the viruses may be spread by fomites and aerosols, and other biting insects, and mortality in calves may reach up to 30%. Gross lesions in these particular uh, cases are pretty much dominated by hemorrhage, ranging from small petechia on the serosa of the abdominal viscera to severe gastrointestinal bleeds. And very characteristically, there is hepatocellular central lobular necrosis as we see here. The necrosis in the liver can be multifocal or can be massive. And in such cases, you will often see the hemorrhages that characterize this disease secondary to consumption of clotting factors and the inability of the liver to make any more. In animals less than a week old, it can be up to 100% mortality, and then the mortality tends to drop as the animals get older. Another real problem associated with Rift Valley fever in endemic areas is abortion. This virus can also infect humans, which develop a similar hemorrhagic fever. Being a bunya virus, it can also cause neural defects if the animal is infected in utero. Okay, here's a great picture of a cut section of liver, probably from a calf, and we can see multifocal to coalescing white dots of variable sizes. And if you said that this was a necrotizing hepatitis, I will give you full credit. Full credit also for separative hepatitis. And this is a classic picture, regardless of the species, of gram-negative sepsis. In the very young animals, I would certainly suspect one of the coliforms. Think about the possibility of an infected umbilicus. If we get a little bit older, I'm going to think about Salmonella, especially the host-adapted Salmonella Dublin, which prefers to cause a septicemia such as this, rather than the raging fibrinonecrotic enteritis and colitis and diarrhea that we see with the non-host-adapted Salmonella typhimurium. Salmonella Dublin can cause a diarrheal disease in some cases, but Normally, the first phases of Salmonella Dublin are typical sepsis, so you will see bacteria within the liver, within the spleen, affecting the mesenteric lymph nodes, and also will cause a, a fibrinonecrotic cholecystitis. Salmonella Dublin is well known for doing that. The animal survives this. It may go on to, give, to get one of those raging diarrheal diseases. And here is what we see with Salmonella Dublin in the gallbladder. You see very thickened, edematous wall of the gallbladder, and then you have this fibrin cast which lines the outside. Gallbladder is always a great place to culture 
if you are thinking about salmonellosis in any species, dog, cat, whatever, think about uh, uh, culturing the gallbladder. Okay, one of my favorite lesions, um, and always shows up a little better if there's a little bit of fat in the liver. You'll notice a lot of the slides that I show have somewhat fatty livers uh, in cattle because the orange sort of makes everything else show up really nicely. But what I want you to see are these flat, bland areas of necrosis. They have a small rim of hemorrhage around them because these areas are largely infarcted. Uh, they are due to extension of Fusobacterium necrophorum into the liver. Fusobacterium necrophorum is a anaerobe and it likes no oxygen so it has evolved over the ages to produce some very powerful exotoxins which cause damage to the uh, to the cells around it probably uh, in the nature of perforins and so it builds up a very nice area of dead tissue around it so it's not going to be bothered by any blood flow it's not going to be bothered by any oxygen to come and disrupt its happy little nest here but the key to diagnosing fusobacterium it's not a difficult diagnosis is these are well demarcated areas of necrosis not separation and if you look at the cut edge it does not bulge so they are very flat they're somewhat dry and crumbly and you will find fusobacterium necrophorum in here you can see fusobacterium necrophorum just about any organ of the animal it is commonly found in the gi tract and the respiratory tract and it's in every cow plop that the, the cow passes so it's common contaminant in cases of foot rot. So don't be surprised to identify Fusobacterium just about anywhere in cattle. I think this was a case from a springbok, um, but that's a ruminant. They have it as well. Just these flat, well demarcated, blanched areas of necrosis. Here we have partial thrombosis, and it will do that as well. If it gets into the blood vessels, it will cause a nice hepatic thrombus. And then when it's in the blood vessel, little bits will break off of this clot and it will go elsewhere and you can find it in the lungs or anywhere else in the body. One more case here, Fusobacterium necrophorum. You're not gonna confuse that with anywhere else and a resulting thrombus. So, this is probably stage two of the classic triad of events in ruminal acidosis. Stage one being ulceration of the ruminal mucosa due to a very low pH. Stage two is when bacteria get into the bloodstream, go shooting through the portal area, and pop out in the liver. And because Fusobacterium is one that will survive the low pH of ruminal acidosis, it's a great one to come into the liver and cause necrosis and thrombosis. And eventually these will break off. They will, little bits will pass through the heart and go into the highly vascularized lung where they may result in fatal hemorrhage. And we're going to look at that when we get to the respiratory system in another lecture. Well, here's a big chronic abscess. This animal might have had ruminal acidosis. This abscess has been walled off by a thick rim of fibrous connective tissue. It is a uh, fantastic chronic abscess. And if you stick your culturette in there, I will bet you a dollar to a donut that you will come back with Truparella pyogenes. This might have been started by Fusobacterium, like we've seen in the last few slides. But Truparella is going to muscle its way in there, and it's going to push everybody out after a couple weeks and set up shop and say, this is my abscess. So you'll see Truparella a lot. It doesn't really mean that it started anything. Just another case in which Truparella was identified by Dr. Derek Mosier, and you can see multiple abscesses here. So we either had a big abscess somewhere along the portal system or we had a massive case of ruminal acidosis.
Well, you could say, I bet I can get Truparella out of this, but as we've seen before, and we'll see in many systems as we go through CAD, look at the characteristic color of this particular abscess. It's not whitish like most of the ones we see. It has a very yellow, sort of granular appearance, and that's because this is Mycobacterium bovis, which characteristically is sort of has a yellow, orange feeling to it. The white material in between these uh, abscesses or these, these pyogranulomas, preferably, is fibrous connective tissue. It is not common to see a lesion like this in an animal with tuberculosis. Uh, probably the majority of cattle show no clinical gross lesions associated with tuberculosis. You may see one lymph node. Now, in these rare cases, which everybody likes to take pictures of, where you get big lesions in the liver or the lungs or whatever, what's happened is that particular lymph node has blown up and the bacteria have been released into the bloodstream. But that's a very uncommon finding because the body walls these off pretty well. So another way to get great uh, lesions associated with mycobacterium is experimentally when the bacterium is injected directly into the bloodstream. So these great, you know, knock your socks off pictures of Mycobacterium bovis are extremely rare and not what you plan to see in the real world. Well, this is a weird one. Look how dark the uh, liver has become. Well, I want you to take a look here. This bile duct has been opened here. And Dr. Derek Mosier, who took this picture, was kind enough to pull a couple of flukes out of the lumen of this bile duct. You can see the surrounding bile ducts. You normally won't see them in the liver. But these are white because the walls have become very fibrotic due to the presence of the adult worms. And when we think about flukes within bile ducts. I want you to think about fasciola hepatica, which is the big one, not only bigger in size than the other one, but uh, is one that causes a number of problems. A simple fasciola hepatica uh, infection usually doesn't cause much of a problem, but we're going to look at some other things that are associated not with the presence of the adult worms in the bile ducts themselves, but the migrations of the immature flukes on their way. Well, this is fasciola hepatica, and you can tell because they're pretty visible to the naked eye. Here's another case of a chronic cholangitis due to the presence of fasciola hepatica. Most of your flukes are usually seen in sort of wet areas. They use snails as their intermediate hosts, either, either one or more. And the snails, the, the circarial stages will mature within the snails. They eventually leave them on vegetation, which the cow comes along and eats. And the metasucarius will rupture through the wall of the gut, and they will get into the portal system, and they will flood the liver. And they, they can do some damage on their own as they move through the liver before they eventually get to the bile ducts. Here's the other one, and it, these are very small. No, nowhere as close to the size of uh, fasciola hepatica. And this is Dicrocelium dendriticum, also living. They have a very long lifespan. Most flukes do, and they can live for years. So you get this progressive fibrosis due to the presence of the, uh, of the parasite. Dicrocelium has a very interesting lifespan. It has two intermediate hosts. The first is a snail. And the snail will secrete the infective cercaria in slime balls where they're picked up by ants. And the ant that picks this one up, um, it migrates to the neural centers of the ant. And the ant is perfectly normal during the day doing its usual ant things, moving leaves around or taking care of the babies or whatever ants do. And uh, when the sun goes down, this immature fluke kicks in and tells the ant to go and climb up to the top of a long blade of grass 
and it gets onto the end of the blade of grass and hangs on by its mandibles, where it's just in a perfect spot for a cow to come along and ingest it. And if it's not ingested uh, over the course of the night, then when the sun comes up in the morning, the ant says, oh, time to go back to work, and it's good for another day. So uh, uh, the flukes drive the ants crazy, probably do more damage to the ants than they do to the, uh, the cattle and the sheep that ingests them. But one of the keys to, uh, to diagnosing the presence of the flukes, and here's one here, you can see them within the bile ducts, is that the bile ducts will become thicker and more prominent. You normally should not see them when you are looking at the, uh, at the surface of the liver. Now, there is a third type of fluke um, that you should be familiar with called Fasciloides magna. Fasciloides magna, um, magna meaning large, it is the largest of the three. But the other thing is that Fasciloides magna does not live in bile ducts. It travels free within the parenchyma of the liver, and as it travels, it causes destruction of the hepatocytes. It eats blood and tissue fluid, and it will regurgitate uh, what we call fluke exhaust or fluke pigment, which is essentially black from being digested blood. You can you can see these tracks within the uh, within the hepatic parenchyma, but it results in fibrosis, eosinophilic and granulomatous hepatitis, and of course the presence of this fluke pigment. In very large animals, it may like moose and cattle, it may not be life threatening. In smaller ruminants. Uh, and small, smaller exotics that are infected with this, they don't have as much liver, and the presence of even a small number of flukes can be life-threatening. If we look at the cross-section of this, you can see how large these flukes are. Here's one here. Here's a fluke here, and here is a fluke here, and probably cross-section. So they're migrating, and these are previous tracks here where they've left their pigment. And you'll note that the hepatocytes around the flukes are sort of whitish because they're sick, um, they've been damaged, the vasculature has been damaged so they're not getting a full ration of oxygen and what hepatocytes do under those circumstances is they accumulate fat. They don't take more fat in but they don't have the energy to, to uh, repackage the fat and excrete it so you get a lot of hepatocellular lipidosis in the areas of the fluke migration. Now, if, oh, and here's a really nice picture of one of these flukes. These are probably all uh, reproductive tract in here. Okay, so if just going through the liver and damaging the liver isn't enough for fasciloides, um, it also has the ability to set up, because of the damage, to prime the animal for a number of other diseases. Now, interestingly enough, we tend early on in our careers to associate this with fasciloides magna, but these two clostridial diseases are more often set off by massive migrations of the larva of fasciola hepatica rather than the individualized, much larger uh, fasciloides magna. So when we think about clostridium hemolyticum, um, a cause of infectious ictrohemoglobinuria. I want to think about fascial hepatica. Um, and the larval forms is the primary driver of this disease. As we talked about before, cattle are not sterile animals. They have clostridial spores in waiting in macrophages throughout the body, um, just waiting for the proper low levels of oxygen and tissue that they are in to set off a period of growth. We see this with Clostridium chauvii causing black leg and injured muscle. And in liver where you have significant damage, you have a couple of Clostridial agents which are prepositioned in the liver which will cause massive proliferation and then damage to the surrounding tissue, ischemia and more, more proliferation and may cause the death of this animal. One of, the, uh, one of the conditions that we can see is known as uh, red water disease. 
due to clostridium hemolyticum, and this results in large infarcts. Um, the clostridium hemolyticum has a number of uh, toxins, and one of the toxins it produces, which gives it the name red water disease, is a phospholipase C, which when it gets into the bloodstream has the ability to cause massive intravascular hemolysis, damaging the membranes of erythrocytes. And so these animals have a hemolytic anemia as well. When they urinate, it is a dark brown to red color, giving it its name. But it doesn't ever happen in the absence of fluke damage though. Another case of bacillary hemoglobinuria, which is another name of clostridium hemolyticum, goes by a lot of names. The other condition that you can see in, uh, in these animals is, is a similar condition which does not have the, uh, uh, it doesn't have the uh, hemoglobinuria associated with it. It's known as black disease caused by Clostridium novii, another preposition uh, clostridial disease that can be activated by the migration of larval fasciola hepatica and rarely fasciloides magna. This is known as black disease due to the color of the infarcts, not black's disease. It wasn't named after some guy named black. Um, so those are the two. And people say, how do you tell the difference? I think some people say, well, you have multiple infarcts with black disease or clostridium novii and one large infarct with uh, bacillary hemoglobinuria. I'm not sure about the veracity of that statement. I think that the better way to do it is, you know, obviously to, uh, to culture or do PCR on affected tissue and then look for the presence of hemolysis. We don't see that with black disease. Only Clostridium hemolyticum has that phosphalapase, which can set off massive intravascular hemolysis. Okay, moving on. This is from a, a large cyst from the liver of a cow, but it could be any type of herbivore, could be a horse, could be a mouse, could be, uh, could even be a person. People get these, and this is the intermediate form of uh, called a hydatid cyst of echinococcus granulosus. Echinococcus granulosus uh, has a definitive host, which is a dog, um, and the most common intermediate hosts are sheep. It's usually a sheep dog, but you can see it in a lot of other. And they have a very thick wall, which is further surrounded by fibrous connective tissue. And these are very protective. You can see them in camel in the middle of the Sahara Desert. And if that camel dies and sits in the sun for seven days, everything else might, might be decomposed. But this hydatid cyst is still going to be in really good shape. And when you cut them open, you can see these protoscolices. And each protoscolex represents an individual larval tapeworm. So when the dog comes and eats this, it's going to get seeded with thousands of tapeworms. Now these tapeworms are very small. They're much smaller than the dipalidium that we normally see in pet dogs. Um, and you can often find them in, uh, in wild canids like foxes or coyotes, um, especially in animals or in areas where sheep are being produced. So echinococcus granulosus hydatid cyst. Most often, because these cystos, you know, they break out, they go to the, get into the portal system, and they go to the liver. And that's the most common place for the cysts to be found in affected animals. But because they're in the bloodstream, you can see them in other places. Second most common would be the lung, but you can see them anywhere uh, in the brain, the heart, the bone, even in the subcutaneous tissues as a rarity. Here is an absolutely beautiful picture of a lesion that everyone should become familiar with because you will see it over and over again in multiple animal species. And it's just something that you need to look at and you need to begin to recognize the pattern. The pattern is a coalescing fibrosis, which predominantly 
starts in the central lobular areas and then will expand. And this is also known as nutmeg liver. It is the result of chronic passive congestion. And the central lobular hepatocytes live on the razor's edge of hypoxia. And they are the last tissue in the body to get oxygen. And any minuscule decrease in the amount of oxygen they get will probably result in their death. They lose touch with the surrounding hepatocytes and they go flushed down the central lobular vein. Um, and then that area is replaced by fibrous connective tissue. And over time, you will begin to develop a pattern that looks a lot like this. Here's a close-up, and these are the viable areas of the deep red, and the sort of orangey to white areas are degenerating hepatocytes and fibrous connective tissue. And it's just a pattern that over a long period of time, you will just begin to, to recognize on site, even in high magnifications like this, chronic passive congestion. And it's anything that causes... Uh, decreased oxygenation of central lobular hepatocytes. Kick it off. This could be high altitude disease, portal hypertension in animals that are moved to high altitude. It could be something that affects the heart, whether it is a congenital defect or a severe case of hardware disease. But uh, nutmeg liver is a very characteristic uh, gross lesion that everyone should be able to identify on site. Diffuse hepatic lipidosis. It is a true disease in cattle, in sheep, in guinea pigs, and cats. In many other species, it's often secondary to other things. And it's most commonly seen in periparturian cattle around delivery rather than a postpartum disorder. It often develops prior to, and it is because these animals are not given an appropriate uh, level of nutrition that is needed for the late stages of growth of the calf, lactogenesis, or milk flow. Usually worsened by inappetence on the part of the cow. And we don't see it in skinny cows. They tend to tolerate marginal uh, nutrition better. It's usually seen in over-conditioned cows at calving. It's a consequence of negative energy balance, not getting enough food rather than getting too much food. It may also be associated with other conditions uh, at calving, including mastitis, displaced abomasum, or metritis. So look for other conditions in association with hepatic lipidosis in cattle. Here's a lesion that's best seen in fatty livers, and this really isn't a, much of a lesion at all. When you look at this, you might think, oh, we have abscesses or we have hemangiosarcoma, but this is a lesion that is seen in cattle. It's also seen in cats. This is known as telangic tape or telangiectasis. And these are just dilated, massively dilated blood vessels, and there's pooling of blood. And nobody really knows what causes it. Some people say that it's subsequent to bacterial infection, but nobody's been able to culture. It's a well-known incidental finding in cattle. In uh, rats and in humans, it's also seen, it's known as called peliosis hepatis. But telange is what people refer to it as, and it could be sort of mild like this, or more severe, or take up most of the liver, but this animal actually did quite well, and it's an incidental finding on the necropsy floor. Here's another incidental finding that you will see, uh, and this is a focal area, usually subcapsular lipidosis, in a cow, and almost always you're going to see a strand of fibrous connective tissue, maybe just a vessel. Um, and this is tension lipidosis. As we said before, uh, 
liver cells or parasites are not used to a whole lot of oxygen and anything that that even marginally impacts the amount of oxygen that you that gets to the hepatocyte may result in morphologic changes or death and and that morphologic change that we see the most in hypoxic hepatocytes is the accumulation of intracytoplasmic lipid because it cannot repackage it and move it along because that takes energy which it doesn't have another case great case of tension lipidosis it was probably a vessel or maybe a little bit of fibrous connective tissue that was holding this tight against the wall okay the liver was pulling back and this area wasn't getting well hypoxygenated and you can actually see the gradation of lipid accumulation here closer to the area of tension and then fading away as we get far away so this is a uh, hepatocellular anoxia due to tension lipidosis okay let's talk about some toxins and toxins are a real problem uh, all over the world plant toxins animal toxins that they get into the liver and we don't have enough time to go through too many of them but let's look at some of the more common ones some of the ones that I f find very interesting this is a great picture from Carolina Mato in Uruguay of a in a liver that is somewhat shrunken there is massive necrosis not a lot of fibrosis because this one you know died pretty quickly and this is due to the ingestion of sawfly larva and you usually find these uh, in the rumen parts of the rumen so it's a pretty easy diagnosis to make and sawfly larva are different in different parts of the world you can see them in Europe you can see them in South America and uh, in uh, in in the South American sawfly pergadin is a major toxin but in European versions it's D amino acid so um, just a sort of a cool toxin with depending on the type of uh, of or the part of the world you're in you're gonna get different toxic uh, uh, agents but certainly not a good thing for cattle to be getting into now the vast majority of cases of hepatotoxicosis that you see you'll never be able to figure out where it came from the majority of these are going to be chronic and if you take a look this is somewhat unusual the typical picture of cirrhosis or end-stage liver disease in ruminants is a very shrunken smooth liver this one has some lumps and bumps okay we don't see the same changes in ruminants that with cirrhosis that we do in dogs you don't have the the marked uh, nodular hepatocellular regeneration the very lumpy bumpy livers they tend to be shrunken whitish and very hard it's still uh, low-grade intoxication long-term necrosis and fibrosis but it tends just to become a shrunken sort of ball of tissue this one's not bad you can see the amount of uh, fibrosis that is going on here and what little liver is left okay a nice cut section showing the amount of fibrosis in these end-stage livers Dr. Paul Stromberg maintains that there's 350 different types of plants that contain pyrolizidine alkaloids a very common intoxicant in Texas alone so you can imagine throughout the world how many different types of plants can result in intoxication uh, aflatoxin would be another major cause um, and many of these plants the animals are exposed to over a period of years so the chances of going back and figuring out exactly what caused this is going to be very difficult when you're presented with a shrunken liver uh, acute intoxications you'll have a chance to figure it out whether it's soft fly or it's blue green algae or something because it should be in the environment um, and you have hepatic necrosis as the major presenting sign rather than this amount of fibrosis so these are very interesting lesions you can point to them and say you know this is probably the cause of death but identifying the toxic principle in these very shrunken fibrotic livers is often a fool's errand 
great picture by Dr. Ricardo Mendez. Um, and one of the things that you will uncommonly see, much more common to see in dogs and cats, will uncommonly see in these chronic intoxications in cattle are acquired portosystemic shunt. Um, as the as the fibrous connective tissue accumulates in the liver, it prevents normal blood flow, and you get portal vein hypertension. The blood simply cannot pass this fibrotic liver. Well, the body will find a way to get the blood back to the major organs, including the brain, and so it's going to open up these vestigial uh, pathways, maybe to the splenic veins or the intercostal veins, the renal veins, or the azygous vein. And uh, you'll see these around the liver, you'll see this proliferation of alternate pathways. These animals will manifest with a number of problems, including hyperammonemia, uh, low weight gain or whatever, because nutrients are not getting through into the liver and the liver is unable to take certain compounds such as ammonia out of the blood, which it normally does. But it does try to preserve the systemic blood supply as long as possible. Here's a great picture of one of those little tiny shrunken fibrotic livers. This particular one was uh, uh, due to sporadesmond toxicity or toxicity from Pithomyces chartarum, a toxin that attacks the biliary epithelium and causes sort of a extra hepatic uh, form of liver failure contained within the liver. Okay, it doesn't really affect the gallbladder too much, but the bile ducts within the liver become occluded and fibrotic and eventually results in uh, uh, in cirrhosis of the liver. One of the signs that you can see of uh, hepatocellular damage is a decrease in the size of a liver. This is a case of lantana toxicosis, and this one's a little different. It's not that shrunken liver. Um, this one has massive necrosis. Grossly, you can see it because the liver becomes floppy becomes floppy like an old dish towel. And when you can see a nice bend in the liver, and the whole thing is shrunken because the gallbladder is much too big. Because the gallbladder is not too big, the liver is too small. So this is massive necrosis due to the penicyclic triterpene lantadine A. There's something definitely wrong with the color of this particular liver. It's sort of a, a tannish putty color, and this is a condition that we're going to talk about a lot when we get to small ruminants, but this is copper toxicity in cattle. Uh, you can see it in cattle. They do take a lot more copper. Sheep don't take much copper, and if you feed the average cattle ration to sheep, you may cause intoxication. But... Uh, a copper toxicity can be seen in cattle. The, you know, essentially the pathogenesis is very similar. It is stored within hepatocytes. When it overwhelms the normal metallothionine uh, concentration in the hepatocytes, it gets free and it goes either into the mitochondria, causing derangement of energy metabolism, or into the nucleus where it activates the uh, caspase cascade and causes. Uh, Apoptosis, and if you get enough of that at once, it is released into the system, causing acute hemolytic anemia, and you get these progressive waves of hepatocellular necrosis, release of copper, hemolytic anemia, more hypoxia to the liver, more death of hepatocytes, and it's sort of a, a vicious cycle. Cattle may get too much copper as part of a poorly mixed uh, mineral supplement, or by the ingestion of chicken litter, who Chickens can take a lot of copper, uh, ruminants not so much. There are also a couple of plants like subterranean clover, um, which accumulate copper. And copper toxicity is enhanced by anything that affects the liver. So any type of other intoxicant, cirrhosis or whatever, 
is going to accentuate the damage caused by excessive copper in the diet. Another, uh, another case of hepatic toxicosis due to gossypol. And, uh, you know, gossypol is often used to increase the protein content of cattle rations. doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Why would you use a known toxicant to increase the protein? It's a byproduct of, of cottonseed meal, and it has significant effects on the liver, and the heart as well by causing cardiac necrosis and potentially heart failure. Um, it does put a tremendous strain by inhibiting uh, glutathione S transferase. So this impairs the liver's ability to metabolize xenobiotics and other toxicants. So there's, Gossipol does a lot of things including increasing red blood cell fragi fragility um, and it just does not seem like a really paying proposition to marginally increase the ration with something that's going to cause so many changes in so many organs. It's also been known to poison dogs. So gossipol, probably not the best idea. Okay, so much for the toxicants. Um, here's a huge hepatic cyst. Uh, and we see hepatic cysts. This is probably a ductal plate malformation. Um, in calves, so you may see them. Oh, we're just about done, and when we talk about tumors uh, in the liver, you can see benign hepatocellular tumors, you can see biliary carcinomas, but the most common tumor, of course, in the liver of cattle is going to be lymphoma. Here's some really big ones. Here's some that, that give the liver more of a diffuse uh, hepatomegalic appearance, but they're both lymphoma. And with that, I think we're done with the liver in cattle. Uh, our next lecture is going to cover skin disease in cattle, and I look forward to giving that to you at the beginning of next week. I hope everybody enjoyed this lecture, and I hope everybody has a great day.